Hello, welcome back to the Cash PT Lunch Hour podcast. This is your host, Aaron LeBauer. And today, my special guest is Allie Taylor. Allie is um, the, one of the owners and creators of Jane App. And so if you've been in the Cash PT Nation, you know that Jane App is one of the bigger, uh, most recommended uh, EMR type of systems. And Allie and I have been trying to find a way to connect with each other the last few years and just keep missing each other. And we finally connected. And I'm super excited to have her on the show. So Allie, thank you for being here. Oh, my honor to be here, finally. Yeah, well, you know, it was all those um, people you sent after me that got me your exactly. attention, right? Um, well, let's see, you, uh, just a little bit more about Ali. She is Canadian, so it seems to be um, a lot of Canadians coming on the show in the last uh, few episodes. Oh, yeah, and, we had Scott recently. Right, we had Scott, Scott yeah. uh, Marcaccio from Myo Detox, and um, Daryl Yardley was about oh, five yeah. episodes yeah. ago. Yeah. Like, so we're, we all know each other, all right. the Canadians. So it's kind of a joke. Everyone's like, oh, do you know this person from Canada? And you have to be like, yeah, I do actually, even yeah. though we always do. We all know right. each other. Right. Well, that's awesome. So um, I brought you on the show for a couple of reasons. I think there's probably a handful, but you own a, you own a clinic or, and you own a Jane app, you own an uh, electronic EMR. So it's like a service, like a business to business business. Mm -hmm. You're, um, a really successful entrepreneur. Um, and uh, there's some information that I don't know about you that I want to find out. So can you share a little bit about, um, I think you told me in the conversation that you're not a physical therapist, but you're, I think one of your parents or both of them were. My parents are. So yeah. your parents are. So how did you get into physical therapy and why didn't you actually become one yourself? I almost became one. I thought about becoming one. I started down that path. I, yeah. Yeah, I say that I'm, I'm the daughter of, physi of physical therapists, which is actually like something. If you meet other people whose parents are physical therapists, you have a little common bond. Yeah. Because it means that you worked the front desk and you did the filing for like, that was your chore. You did the filing of the paper charts and the stamping and the photocopying and the shredding. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's why I created a paper list. <laughs> <laughs> right? Maybe it's like my child labor days of working in a practice brought me to this place. I never connected it that far back. Um, so you kind of start in that world and you just learn a lot about what it looks like to be, you know, a physical therapist, um, and especially a private practice owner. Both my parents actually own private, very different private practices. Mm -hmm. Um, and so growing up, I lived in that world. And then I, I took over managing, um, when I was at school, I was going to university for English literature, which is a path of its own. I started doing kin thinking I was going to be a physio. And then I had English teachers that just, I had multiple English teachers just really encouraged me that I needed to do something with writing. Um, and it's odd, one person telling you you're good at something in your life just can change everything about what you do. So I ended up taking more English classes and it just, that's, anyway, it turned into being my major. So then I thought I was gonna be an English teacher. I really love teenagers. So I thought I was gonna teach high school uh, English 12, that's sort of what I was thinking. Um, and then my final year of university, my manager of my father's clinic quit very suddenly. And he was mm -hmm. like, please just take over. Because as we, as you all know, as uh, practice owners, when your admin uh, staff quit on you, you are kind of screwed. You don't really, right. like, you don't know what they're doing up there most of the time or what the process is or how to find out where everything, like the passwords to get into stuff. And like, honestly, it's when, a, when an admin staff quits without uh, re replacing themselves, that's actually my, even still for my clinic that I currently have, it's my biggest nightmare because I'm, I'm it, like, I still own this clinic. So if she quits, I'm going to have to go and, and stay. that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go work at the front desk at Canopy for, that's what I'll do. Right. If well, that's quits. a, that's a great she shout quits. out to all the administrators, no right? <laughs> no, they're, um, they're really amazing. I actually did a whole talk once at a conference about, um, front, uh, about your administrative staff and how to train them and how to train them because they're so valuable and actually mm -hmm. An underutilized resource often you just kind of can throw anyone in there and so you always have this there's kind of this split um i well, i could talk about administrators and clinics for forever mm -hmm. it's fascinating but there you could there's a split between like do i hire someone who i know is going to be amazing but leave me in a year uh or do i hire someone that i think is going to be more of a lifer but may not be like super high quality and mm -hmm. i always get the ones that leave me in a year so you know you'd always have this turnover of staff and they'd go off to do many things so i think 
how you make an administrative job an actual career is also super interesting because I was an office manager yeah. and I, that's how I stayed. I was like, at one point I was like, you know what? I really love this. I love what mm -hmm. I'm doing. I would get my colored pens and my desk calendar and I would organize everything. Um, and so I was like, well, I guess this could be considered a career. So then I just did it full time for a couple of years after I graduated. So I had my bachelor degree in, um, I call it my BA, my big awesomeness. Mm -hmm. It's a degree in English, which pretty much gets me nothing if I have to go out and actually find a job at this point. I'm, it's the reason I start my own businesses. No one will employ me. Right. Um, my minor is in psychology, though, which is helpful. In the real world, it's helpful. Right. I probably use that more than I use my English degree. And so I was like, this is a real job. I'm going to stick with it. So I started, I kept managing this clinic. We outgrew the space. So then I worked on purchasing a second practice. So we purchased a second practice to grow into. And then a few years later, um, and in this time I, I had children. Mm -hmm. um, and then a few years later, we, I had a couple of the practitioners that were, that were leaving um, for mat leaves. And when they came back, they wanted to work on that longer model. So they were originally working on the staggered mat model where multiple people would come in every 15 minutes. And they wanted to switch to a longer model, which is probably most consistent with cash based. Would you say that's most cons consistent? Yeah. With cash -based practice? Most most people get into cash based physical therapy in the United States so that they can spend longer time. Long. With patients. So, yeah. Yeah. So similar. And, you know, we had a similar story where these very short um, visits became the norm in physiotherapy. We call it physiotherapy. So I'll switch between the two, mm -hmm. my Canadian version and the American version. Um, and they started with short visits because originally physio was under our single payer healthcare system mm -hmm. in BC, and they didn't pay very much per visit. So similar to the way that um, insurance doesn't pay a lot for physical therapy visits, even like if you're in network, that same, same kind of idea. Right. And so they would do up to like eight visits in an hour, just stacking them through. And so it was a very different style of treatment. And then slow, then they left the single payer system. So now physical therapy, if you're out in private practice, it's all cash based. So but you do, um, you're not under the single payer, payer system, but you are under the, what you guys have is the extended benefit system, but it's just a, it's a different world here. Right. If we want to talk about the different ways that Canadian and U.S. insurance play together, it's very, it's fascinating too. It's much easier, but everyone that comes, they're either paying cash or you're billing their insurance company, but mm -hmm. the insurance companies are, are paying like a hundred percent of the time. Yeah. And without a lot of fight. And anyway, it's quite different. Um, so they wanted Very to go different. to these longer models. So I opened, um, I was like, oh, well, I only need a two room clinic for these mm -hmm. two physios that wanted to work shorter. I'm like, no problem. I can just find a, another location. I can just open a little clinic for them. I'm like, I, I know how to do that. That seems easy. And then I went looking for space. And the only commercial real estate I could find locally was they were too big. And so I kind of walked away from that for a while. And then I realized um, I just fell in love with the space. Honestly, I saw the space in my, it's a beautiful little village area that the clinic's in. And I knew I could do, if I did eight treatment rooms, I could create a business plan. And the midwives that delivered my babies wanted space. Anyway, I had enough of a little skeleton crew of practitioners that I thought, okay, I can probably make this work. And then I just went out and advertised for different types of practitioners. Um, and so then I ended up with, I think there's 30 practitioners there now. So it's mm -hmm. physio, chiro, massage. I had NDs uh, originally, but a really wonderful ND opened up right kind of in our complex. And so I'm like, I'm not going to hire any more NDs because yeah. everyone should go to you. Um, the, mid the midwives, I say them, counselors, dietitians, acupuncture, osteo, everything. So there's like a real big, a real mix in the yeah. back. So that's how it kind of ended up there. It was like a real, you know, when my kids say, what do you, you know, you say to your kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah which I think is a weird question. I would never have said <laughs> that I was going to own a, a software company or a healthcare clinic. Yeah. Or, yeah. That's, that's wild. So you were working for your, for one of your parents or both of them. And then you decide, okay, I'm just going to open my own clinic. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it's know, just like, whatever. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm just I just go play baseball uh, over here. <laughs> well, I think when it's something that you're doing every day, it doesn't seem, and honestly, I always say this. I just had a lot of meetings and other people said, yeah. So I met mm -hmm. with a designer about designing the space and I met with a contractor about building this. Like I didn't build the space or right. the designer. And then I, that's how I met um, Trevor, the founder of Jane, was his company. Um, we talked about him doing the branding and the website um, for, and all that digital for my, uh, for Canopy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so he came to help with that. And during that process of opening Canopy, 
I was complaining because I could not find software that worked for that many different disciplines, yeah. especially for electronic charting, which at the time, that was in 2011. That was in 2011. Um, at the time, there was very little um, online, like online booking I really wanted and electronic charting. Mm -hmm. And so he, he offered to just, um, he offered to, to build me something as part of the website design. So the original version, the very early version of Jane was just um, designed for Canopy. So mm -hmm. it was on looking electronic charting and I used it for over a year just in the practice with all those different people. And it just worked, it worked yeah. great. That's yeah. awesome. Was it that the other options were too big? They were relying on just like, they were only built for physios or too much on like insurance yeah. and not on None of them, customer service? None of them had online booking at the time. So I was gonna have to use online booking separately from an EHR. Yeah. And then the ones that were EHR were all very discipline specific. Mm -hmm. So there were one, and um, honestly online charting um, was very new at the time as well. And it was not, it wasn't great. Um, like, and I, I didn't have room to store charts. So, and I knew how expensive paper charting is. It's surprisingly expensive. And I think people don't add up the cost of paper charting. Um, when you look at how much it costs in, in toner and paper and shredding and storage and photo, and I just, I was like, there's no way I can do that. So I knew I needed something for electronic charting. Yeah. But uh, yeah, they just weren't flexible enough for, right. and I always say this because even if you put five physical therapists next to each other, they're all going to chart differently. It's not like, this is how a physical therapist does their documentation. Mm -hmm. Like they might, if their software forced them to, but it wouldn't be ideal. And I always think back to those like paper template. Did you ever paper chart? Yeah. So we, I, I, when I was a student, there was one in the clinic and it was just, the charting was basically check boxes yeah. on paper. And then when I got out of PT school and opened my own business, I was like, why am I paying 8% in a $2,000 onboarding fee or 200 bucks a month when I don't need that because I'm not filing insurance claims and there wasn't right. anything simple where that didn't quite required me to just be very, I, I mean, I only need to document for myself, yeah. you know, and, and to cover my, and to CYA, cover my ass from a, <laughs> from a perspective of, you know, um, liability and, you know, maybe a motor vehicle accident, not for sure. There was nothing that fit that either. So I did, yeah. I, I made my own paper charts and yeah. I print them and choop, 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 and it'd take me two minutes. <laughs> exactly. Because you could do it in a way that really suited your style of practice. Mm -hmm. and the reason that no documentation is the same is because if you see five physical therapists, you're getting different treatment. Like right. I will walk in for the exact same injury and I will have the exact same complaint. And depending on the education that the therapist has done, like, just their basic interests, what mm -hmm. they've seen, how they've treated it before. Like it, it this is all part art, part science. Right. And you'll, when I was pregnant, I, um, I used to get numbness in my arms and like, I'd go to sleep. I couldn't like feel my arms when I woke up. That's a lot of, that's a personal story that we're just going to mm -hmm. throw in. I have a, I do have a point. I, yeah. there, we'll get here. And I went and I saw three different people over the course of my pregnancy for the same thing. And they all treated me in, not even differently, but in a different part of my body. Like some went under, one went over, and all. And my symptoms were relieved in every every time. Mm -hmm. So like you're so how they're going to document that is obviously going to be different, even though I I presented with the same symptom. And so Jane really accommodated that for, be, like even within discipline, because it had to accommodate that across disciplines. Right. So Jane became this sort of flexible documentation platform that really kind of respected that everyone works differently mm -hmm. in a discipline. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, it seems like to me, from my experience, a lot of the EMRs that I looked at were built with the purpose of making it easy for me to file claims. Right. <laughs> and versus and what you did, it sounded like you built it, ba you know, to make it easy for people to document and get access to your clinic, and, right? Something like that. Yeah. Well, the charting specifically, because it's, you can build templates. So if mm -hmm. you need to make sure you're documenting everything in a certain way, you can build a template that just ensures that you follow through all the steps in order to do that. So I often say like we have, there's <clears throat> every geography and discipline has different rules, but there's consent for treatment mm -hmm. that you have to obtain. Um, and it's part of the like licensing test that you do when you first become a physical therapist, you have to receive oral consent for treatment. And so you don't actually have to have them sign anything, but you have to document that you received oral consent for treatment. Right. So we're like, we'll just create a checkbox in your template that says, 
received oral consent for treatment and then check it off. So now you're just making, sh you're just reminding yourself at this point to do mm -hmm. these steps. And that's where you were talking about that software are built that way, yeah. but they're built with the templates already preformed so that like you have to do whatever they've decided is the way to charge. Mm -hmm. Whereas, <laughs> excuse me, with a template builder, you can really build any way you want. So if you're a pediatric practitioner, or if you do orthotics, if you do acupuncture, you can build templates and just drop those pieces in if you do it for that person, but not yeah. if, you, if you don't. So it just gives you a little bit more flexibility about how you build them. Yeah. And I always think, I think about those paper forms because people would always say, here's my paper form, make it, make it an electronic version for me. And I would like refuse unless they sent me a filled out form. I'm like, I want to see exactly how you use this form. Because in clinic, what happens is you create this very robust template thinking, I'm going to fill out all these things. Mm -hmm. And what happens in reality? You don't you use half of it. <laughs> top right corner and the bottom middle section. Yeah. And you ignore the rest of it. But because it's paper, you can't change it. You've photocopied 100,000 of these things and you got to work through all of them. And so I'm like, I will not rebuild this for you. I will not tell you how to make this an electronic version unless you send me like mm -hmm. five filled out, black out the names and show me five of your filled out chart templates. Mm -hmm. So it's just like transitioning people. And this actually happens not just from paper, but if people are moving from a different software to Jane, you mm -hmm. almost have to like decondition them because we build workflows and we build process around what's available to us. So our clinic yeah. becomes run in a way, not because it's the best way, but because it's the way our software makes us do something. And then you become very good at that. Yeah. So yeah. sometimes there's a little bit of a, a little, let's just, we had to like, what is it called when the people are leaving a quarantined area and they have to go through that like desanitization process where they get. Right. It's desanitization. Where is where they, where the, their horns go yeah. like that. And they're in a suit. And then I don't know. That's decontamination. Yes. That's, that's what it. You have to do. So you have to sort of like work through the fact that, you know, cause it's amazing those admin staff, when you sit at a front desk with them, they will not even look at what they're pushing on the screen. They just know where everything is. Mm -hmm. So even though it can take like 10 clicks to get to something, man, they can do it fast. Yeah. If you change that button, you're screwing them over. This is why everyone hates it when Facebook changes anything. Put it back no. the way it is and everyone puts the whole. Cause everything's gone. On. Cause people get, do, do things by default. They don't like they get yeah. used to it and they don't know why they're doing it. They're just doing it and they question it. Right. And then they go, Well, you don't question it when you're really busy and it's something you're doing on the side and you just don't want to learn something new. And it's, it's definitely challenging and muscle memory is so strong. Yeah. That, yeah. Change. And I always, so when I started um, running the practice, the first thing I did was like, well, why do we do it this way? Every time I was being taught, why do we do it this way? Which isn't, no, this is why I'm also not able to work for anyone. Wouldn't you hate me? Yeah. I would be the worst employee. Well, why do we do it this way? And um, often the answer was like, well, this is just how we've always done it. And I'm like, well, maybe there's a better way to do this. So like I took all, we were doing paper payroll. So I created an Excel sheet and I Googled like, how do I make an Excel sheet add things up for me? And then I created these forms where it would do the percent calculations for me. And so payroll used to take two days for the manager who I took mm -hmm. over. I literally do it in maybe half an hour. I'm like, wow. you just plug the numbers in. So then I got bored. So that's when I started. I, that's when I started looking for the things because then I yeah. got it. So it sounds like your person that doesn't like to um, waste time with uh, BS stuff that you can get done either automatically <laughs> or much faster. Well, right? if what computers were even invented for to add things together. I think mm -hmm. that was their primary purpose, wasn't it? Yeah. Adding together initially. Adding ones it? and zeros. Is yeah. I think the computers can handle this part for us. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it just allows you to be it allows you to be more present if you're, if you're doing things um, like I loved talking to people who came in and having that personal relationship with the front desk staff. Yeah. Have you ever noticed how many Christmas presents your admin staff get at Christmas? <laughs> it's just crazy. Like the amount of chocolate and cards and that's a, that's a real testament to the relationship they build with these people. Yeah. We used to have um, patients that would get better and not need physio anymore, but still come and just sit in the waiting room. And, and just like, come hang out. <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. And I was like, that's amazing. That's like, um, there's something about that that I think most businesses don't manage to accomplish. Mm -hmm. That person, that, and I think healthcare, kind of in general, caregivers, and there's an entire, there's something there that I think is untapped in, yeah. in many practices. Where do you think, 
Where do you think that came from? Is that just your experience working with your parents or are there other things, experiences or um, interactions or, exam or or people in your life who've kind of formed you to this person who's like, okay, not only are we going to build a great experience for patients, but if there's an inefficiency and there's an easier way to do something, I'm going to get it figured out. You know? It might be laziness. Yeah. That's Maybe. fair enough. Just that I just want something else to do the work because I'm like, this is pointless doing this over and over again. Um, I don't know. You know, I, I, that's an, I don't know why I am the way I am. Yeah. Can anyone answer that question? What I don't know. <laughs> you are today. That was a very deep question for this podcast this morning. Yeah. Um, I don't know what formed me the way I am. You know, was there something that changed in your life? Like when you were growing up or in, in university or you know, early on where you're like, okay, since that point, or this person said that thing to me and it like, it changed I, something or is this I, just, I don't know. I like to, I'm, I like to be good at things and I like to win and I'm quite competitive. Mm -hmm. So I think part of it is to do with that. Yeah. I don't, aren't most people sort of generally dissatisfied with the, with things that are just not as good as they could be. Maybe. But there's, there's a lot of people that are, and they don't do anything about it. And you're clearly someone oh, exactly. who's done something about it, you know? That's and just pure narcissism. Yeah. Like fully believing that I'm capable of doing things that I probably shouldn't believe I'm capable of doing. Isn't that just, isn't that all? What, there's a good quote about this. It just takes optimism and delusion or something to get something done. Like you have to not recognize all the things that could go wrong. Yeah. But well, I actually, I think small businesses, we talk about how we've grown Jane. Mm -hmm. Jane's a software company, right? Jane's a tech company and quite different in how you run a tech company from how you run a clinic or well, usually it's quite different, but Trevor and I both came from small businesses. And so we ran Jane from the very beginning, the same way we ran a small business, which is like, you make revenue, you pay your staff, you don't take any, you don't make any decisions that are going to sync your company mm -hmm. so your risks are calculated and small and measured and that's um that's unusual so i guess i guess your your story does define you to some degree so having successes along the way and like i was kind of incubated in my parents yes yeah. safety net i guess and then i could go out on my own and that went okay and then i've never had a failure so big that i've been so discouraged mm -hmm. What were the failures you had along the way that maybe looking back, you're like, oh, that was a failure, huh? I didn't really, you, you might not, you know, because a lot of times successful entrepreneurs don't see failures. They see opportunities for learning and growth. But what you see, see what I mean? Like, like that's a thing <laughs> that other people see. Like what, what, I, what did, what did yeah. you try that didn't work out as the way you thought it was going to work out? I, this, I find this question like really, really challenging to answer because I, I'm, I think I'm, I think we're so good at defining failures as, as learnings or, mm -hmm. and we never take risks that are so big that a failure is catastrophic. Mm -hmm. Whenever we're making a decision, even at, at Jane or in any part of my life, I'm always like, well, what's the worst thing that could happen? That's sort of like the first thing I go do. Actually, I heard um, Chris Hadfield, do you know who he is? Mm -mm. He's a Canadian astronaut. He actually, I think he flew with NASA and he's very, he's a Canadian hero. Have you ever seen an astronaut playing guitar in space? Anyway, Chris Hadfield, he's like, he's, um, he's lovely. He's a wonderful human. And he, we heard him speak and he just talked about how being an astronaut, all they do is focus on what could fail. You run every scenario a hundred times, but what could fail? Cause then you're prepared for it as opposed to, so if you're too optimistic all the time and you don't look at the failure, you're just not ready for it when it happens. So we kind of always say, well, what's the worst thing that could happen if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Then we'll go, okay, what's the best thing that could happen? And then kind of work in that direction. So like failures, if they fail, oh, I know. Okay, wait, I have a failure. Yeah. So we have very strong opinions about how we would like Jane to be presented in the public. And the same as any clinic would, you have a public perception. You actually have a clinic, clinics have souls. And I say that with the most scientific background uh, and belief system, <laughs> but I'm like, Right. They have a feel like every clinic that you walk in has a feel mm -hmm. and all the clinics that I I've worked at, I've had a feel. And when I opened canopy, there was no common gym area the way I've had in all the other clinics. It's just closed treatment rooms. 
And I was super worried that that was going to affect the feel of the practice because I've always worked in ones that are very social. Like you'll have your knee replacements. They'll all start booking in at the same time and encourage each other. And when the bike seat goes down a notch, they're celebrating and there is a real community feel to them. And, I, and then anyway, yeah, depending on the clinic, they're all very different. And I was worried that Canopy would not have a, a feel like that because it was all closed treatment rooms. But it ended up with its completely own, it felt more like a spa-like and the midwives had all these pregnant women coming through. So it, was, it ended up being a little bit of a women's health clinic. Um, and it, that's okay. It's like, it's a different feel, but it mm -hmm. still has its own very specific kind of feel to it. So I, I learned that that's okay. But so Jane, we feel the same way. Like I have a very specific and strong view about how Jane presents in the public. And we like, we, we like to be like transparent and honest and we don't oversell and we have all these things that we feel strongly about. Um, and so anyway, at one point we're like, okay, we should try this marketing thing. So we have gotten to where we are now. We've got um, tens of thousands of practitioners. We have 80, just over 80 staff now. So. Wow. It's starting to feel like a real crew of people. And we're like, okay, we're supposed to be doing this marketing thing. So we're like, we're going to try um, just social media ads, like Facebook ads. And so we didn't have a, we didn't have a, any staff yet in-house. We didn't have any marketing team. So we're, we're like, while we start looking for our in-house marketing team, we'll just use, we'll outsource it to this, this agency. And so we're going to just try. This is what they do. How bad can it be? And how bad can it be is just we spend money and it doesn't work. So that's fine. Yeah. We made that call. And so we got this agency and they were like, oh, well, here's what we do. We do a broad net where we want to send ads to everyone. And then we let the algorithm tell us who it's working for and who it's not working for. And I'm like, okay, but like we pretty much know who Jane, a good fit for Jane is. Like it doesn't, it's not everybody. And we, we're quite clear about that. When people call us and talk about using Jane, if they're not a good fit, we'll be like, you shouldn't use Jane. Like you should use this other product that's going to be better for you. So we will turn people away before we'll sign them up if it's not a good fit. And they're like, no, no, this is how we do. You got to trust us. And then and they build these ads. And we're like, these ads are horrific. It's like stock photos of people in I don't know. It's just so awful. And it was so like it actually made me un like the the way I feel right now. Yeah. I, honestly, I couldn't even look at them. I was just like, I can't believe we're putting this out there. And they, so they just said, you got to commit six months. You got to just let us do our thing. It's going to be amazing. So we're like, fine. Obviously, since I told you this is a failure already, it was, yeah. it, it, it didn't, it was not successful. What happened? Was it that, you know, like they, they weren't bringing in leads or, and it wasn't making money or it was just communicating was so bad you were pulled the plug. I mean, what, what happened? They, so we did the full, like, okay, fine. Do your broad net thing. And then they started whittling it down like, oh, this ad seems to be performing a little mm -hmm. bit better and all this stuff. And by the time they got down to like at the, the audience, I'm like, this is the audience I told you at the very beginning you were going to get to, which is right. people who actually need our product, which we could have just like set a few settings on Facebook and be more specific and mm -hmm. had a real conversation. Anyway, it was, it was awful. So we did six months. We wasted however much money, <laughs> hundred grand probably. Like, which is significant. That's, all, that's uh, nothing. I mean, I'm laughing, but that's a lot of money. <laughs> a lot. And you, you know what we learned, which is a good lesson, because I think you're constantly, as founders especially, who feel very close to your, like, very emotional, right, about mm. your brand and your product. Um, I think we learned to just trust ourselves. Like, that's okay. It's okay to have a high bar about what's acceptable. I don't want to, like, if I see an ad for Jane that I'm embarrassed by online, that's just like, like, can you imagine if putting your practice out there under some, like, right. it's like, oh, anyway, it's just awful. So that was, that was a failure, but it was also such a good lesson. Like, we don't outsource for a reason. It's mm -hmm. because we, we create a very specific um, brand identity within our team, and they represent Jane out in the world. And I 100% trust with all of them to do that. Yeah. So we don't know anything, support, dev, it's all in-house. That's awesome. When you come up with that, like a brand identity in your, in your mission, and you've got 80 people, how do you convey that to everyone so everyone's on the same page? It, ch it changes as you grow, like no business remains the same. And looking back at practice life, I think it's interesting because I often struggled. I really want to do like team building with my like staff and... Uh, and I was like, why, you, why, you don't our, why don't they show up when I'm like, okay, we're going to like do a movie night or whatever. And people just wouldn't come. And I'd be like, why don't they want to hang out or do this fun, mm -hmm. like all 
my husband was working for um, a development company and they would go and do like yoga at lunchtime together, do all these things like hot air, like hot air balloon rides, like most ridiculous things. And they all would go and have all this team stuff. And I'd be like, how come my people? And then in retrospect now, I'm like, they were all, they were working their whole shift and they all had young families, which I did yeah. not at the time. Right. And I was like, it's fascinating how if you compare yourself to externally to other even other clinics to clinic, like now I, like Myo Detox is a great example. They have a, a wonderful company culture that mm -hmm. involves a lot of like team building type activities. I could not get my staff to show up. And that felt like a failure to me. I actually never understood yeah. why I didn't do that. But if I look back and I was actually respectful of my the stage of life of the people who I worked with, what would have worked better for them? Would have been the best thing that I could have done if I could go back would be to pay them for an hour of their time if I wanted everyone to do something together, it was actually pay them for that time and then enforce, like we're going for lunch and you're all getting paid. Yeah. Like what you would normally get paid to treat like to treat patients and we're gonna go and have lunch together. That's the only way it would have worked. Anyway, yeah. so when, you, when you're when you trying to build that and, and grow it within like an organization that's scaling, that's a whole different question. And I love talking about that. I, I, would, I would love to talk about it. Do you think it's relevant to, to clinic life yeah. yeah i mean you know like i need to i want to know like if if i know how i can do it for you know three or four people right what if i have 15 to 20 and then i mean what if i do have 80 there are people listening to this this podcast that have all kinds of okay this is like one of my favorite topics scaling culture i think it's so interesting and you yeah. have to do it it's and we're so intentional about it um we wrote out our values document. You can actually see it on our website. All of our job postings linked to our values document. Mm -hmm. And we wrote this, I wrote it with much cursing very early on in Jane's life because at the time it was like, I think we were at six or seven people, <coughs> excuse me. And I was, um, I was super operational. So I'm responding to every support email. So taking half a day off to go and do an exercise like this was, I wasn't interested in, I was, frustrated but now it's grown with us over the last five years or four years and it's been sort of like people apply say they say I read your values and that's why I, I applied for this job and so we're actually we're doing a user conference actually next summer mm -hmm. I did not intend to plug that here but I will plug that here it's really amazing we're getting our community together and one of the talks that I would love to do is talking about writing out your values as an organization, because even though I didn't appreciate it at the time, it's, it really has shaped the way that we hire, the people that we hire. So what we do now um, with every, we call them kind of cohorts that come in. So once a month, everyone that just started with Jane in that month, we go over the values document. So Trevor and I sit down with the, the new cohort and we talk about why we've created this values document. And then we talk about each value and why we think it's important. But really the most important thing about it is at the end, I, we, there's this quote that I heard that culture is more, um, more like gardening than architecture. And we talk about how it changes continuously. And as you grow, it evolves. There's no, there's no keeping culture. There's only evolving culture, especially in something that's growing and changing. And so we said, each one of you are a part of that. Like if you talk, think about it like a garden, you're each a flower and every flower is going to grow into something different and it's going to mm -hmm. be a part of that. And whereas architecture, it's more someone's telling you what it's going to be and then you're conforming to that shape. Right. And so we say very, like very clearly to every new cohort, there's no, you're, no one's giving you a culture. You create a culture every day when you walk in the store. You own that culture. This is your responsibility. So we say, this is what we have. If you don't think this is what we have, we'll adjust it because it's not going to stay the same. But so far, it's stayed true. Our values in our values document still feel pretty good, according to our, our team. We kind of assess it every now and then. And then I'm like, and now your job, this is your full-time job, is creating this culture. And one of our values is work hard. And then we tie that back. And we're like, you work hard because it allows you to enjoy this culture. You work hard. That's the reason you're working hard is because we're all enjoying living in this mm -hmm. sort of system that we've built so we we don't have a culture person like every single person is responsible for that and then as you create microcultures, like our support our support team is going to have a microculture our devs are like everyone as you grow of course they break off into smaller pieces and so then i'm like now these microcultures have to now feed into this greater culture and they're going to look a little bit differently and that's fine we're not trying to like 
set anything in stone. Everything's going to evolve. And that'll be true even in clinic. When you have people leave and people join, it's going to change the culture. There's, you don't have to be like so concerned about it staying exactly the same, but there are some like really basics. Like we have one story where someone started very early on and she was supposed to be a U.S. insurance specialist actually. And she started and the phones were ringing. And that point, like if the phones are ringing, like whoever is available and capable. So we're like, oh, can you just grab a call? And she's just said, oh, I don't answer the phone. <laughs> and we fired her the next day. We're like, here's your severance check. Like, yeah. that's not going to work. So like, we have some values that we literally will fire next day over. Like, yeah. it, what, are our what are those? Um, if you are um, creating and like, if you are violating that, the culture of mm -hmm. inclusivity, we have a no, there's no bullying, like, oh my goodness, we would never even get to bullying. But if you, we also had early on, and actually most of these lessons have been learned over time. We also had a, a, a developer who started before we, like very, very early on as well. We were working with another company in the same space, kind of together. And um, he was a bit uh, like different, right? Like a lot of devs. <laughs> I they <should> are. <laughs> They're different. I mean, we're all very different. Yeah. Every human being is different. Fundamentally, we're all different. Uh, and he he was a bit of an odd duck, and he was just um, ostracized in that like playground. It's like that little girl playground way. Yeah. I got a call. My my youngest son punched his friend, and I was like, it just feels like punching someone, getting it over with. Sometimes can be the best result. <laughs> Other than the like slow, like just just awful, like just making someone feel bad about themselves essentially until they leave. And we're very, I'm very against that. So if anyone's behaving in a way that breaks that rule, I don't care how good they are at their job, they're not sticking around. Yeah. So we've, we've fired a few times for things like that. And every time you do, it actually strengthens your culture. And at the clinic, I had someone, I had someone who came in and she started stirring up dissent and it was so fascinating because I was getting the same complaints from multiple people with literally the exact same words. And uh, you just recognize this was being created by a single person. And I didn't let her go fast enough. Like I'm better at it now. Like I've mm -hmm. learned a lot. Were the complaints coming from staff or from patients? Yeah. 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 Staff. And then as soon as I, I told her, I'm not renewing, like you're, you're out. All of those other staff settled right back down. So it's really interesting how they say like that bad apple. Mm -hmm. It really is true. Like they, it creates an entire, it's like a different microculture and you don't want to have that in your, in your business. And you think, you think the revenue they're bringing or the work they're doing might make it worth it. It never does. I literally, yeah. it never, ever, you can, and you got to make that decision fast. There's no, someone who's a slow learner or there's a lot of things you can you can kind of overcome but mm -hmm. are there certain qualities that you look for when people when you're hiring them are they going to fit in your culture or are they like other things like what are you looking for well it depends on the role we actually just had a meeting about this right before this meeting i was in one about learnability like so jane is ever evolving and mm -hmm. um you have to be able to learn as you go, like we're releasing new features. Jane's, we call Jane, sometimes we say Jane's a big lady. She does a lot of things and she didn't start out this way. Like when we first started, obviously she was just charting and online booking, but then right. we had a whole billing side. And then now we have like data and report, like all of the stuff. And then every single, you should look at our feature request list. It's thousands of things on there. And so at some point we're gonna have to start not adding them directly to the product and we're going to be adding them as like optional add-ons that you can mm -hmm. it just gets it just gets to be outrageous and they say we're we're SaaS, which is software as a service and there's lots of conversations about um when your product outpaces your pricing you set your price but your product grows and then your price remains the same so what does that look like but coming from clinic and just what i think is fair we've always grandfathered in people based on like you made it you said it made an agreement at a certain point in time for a certain price right. anyway that's like software and development and changing what people expect because no one wants your product to be stagnant they expect change and yet anyway so all of that is also super interesting it's kind of like fee schedule increases in your practice people are always so worried about it and i'm like mm -hmm. you just do it you just do it people will complain for two weeks 
and then no one will ever mention it ever again. And so I'm, it's funny to me how often people are so worried about that right. and usually how little effect it actually has on your client base, which yeah. I think that's your, isn't that your story normally? That's one of them. Yeah. You know, it's like, I think people are afraid, like they're, they're afraid of like for selling and raising rates and a lot of other things. They're just afraid of being um, rejected and being told no and being you know perceived as something other than being helpful. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's a level of just respecting the fact that your work is, you have knowledge, like no one, there's, I forget what the psychological principle is called, but you don't um, appreciate your own knowledge the same way that you appreciate other people's knowledge. Right. I think it's the same as like, I was thinking about this. I saw a car with a for sale sign on it. And when you're trying to sell something, cause you don't want it anymore. I think that you probably are willing to value it at less than someone who wants that item. Right. Like there must be studies about this. Yeah. And you know what? I think it depends here. I would say that it depends on like how much time you've put into it. Cause I've sold, I've bought and I've bought and sold therapy and I've bought and sold old cars <laughs> for old cars. Maybe you overvalue. Yeah. Well, yeah so the people overvalue it. No one wants to pay it. And then for therapy, people undervalue it. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, and, don't, you don't appreciate your own knowledge enough. So we talk about this yeah. at work as freebies and mm -hmm. not freebies for therapists you've done years of schooling and then actually just the ongoing education of treating people over and over again and learning yeah. pattern recognition like oh right okay i know the best outcome for this is going to be to provide these modalities and this number of treatments over this period of time because i've done this a thousand times like so i know what works best here right. and all of that knowledge wrapped up into a human but then you just think yeah, I've always known that. Like, it's interesting how quickly new knowledge becomes, I've always known that, or everybody knows that, even though it, it wasn't true. Right. Like even so running Jane as being an ongoing educator, I basically got an MBA, like running a new business. Well, running Canopy was kind of an MBA, like you ran a, a clinic mm -hmm. and learning how business works. Before I, before Jane, I was thinking of franchising Canopy actually, because I was bored. <laughs> I get to the point where I'm like, oh, it's running fine. Let's do something new. So I got a book out of the library. I'm like, how do I franchise something? Like, what does that even mean? And then I had people that sort of wanted a canopy. I had another physical therapist actually who was asking about, I want to work at one, but I don't want to come to North Vancouver. Can you put one yeah. here in Steveston? And then it made me think, hmm, maybe I should. So this is the thing. I just say yes to things like that I probably shouldn't say yes to. Mm -hmm. I just say yes constantly to the things that come up in front of me. So then I was going to franchise and I probably still would have, I would have done that had we hadn't had Jane not come along. Yeah. We're kind of joking about being the we work of, of healthcare now. Like maybe we should just open Jane clinics all over the place. The mm. we work of healthcare. Anyone need space? Anyone out there need space? Tell me. Right. Tell me if this is a good idea. Although not the like complete crash, horrific story that we work has recently had. Yeah. We work is that uh, where you go and you sublease space? Yeah, it's like office space for rent. So they just yeah. bought or at least huge amounts of real estate all over the world, all over the world, North America for sure. Yeah. And then um, you just go and you rent a desk. But so yeah, clinic, you could kind of do that. You could rent a space, have an open gym. It's interesting. Yeah. People do that here. They're more like sublease, but it, not on like a large scale, like as the business. And what model. if I had like a nice brand though? And I had like beautiful right. branding, great software, coffee. Admin staff, like admin, admin staff. staff, you didn't have to worry about. Yeah, I just have to pay five hundred dollars a month and find my own patients. Yeah, exactly. Something like that. Yeah, that'd be joint venture. <laughs> Maybe that sounds like a good idea. That's interesting. I'd like to talk more about that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have. I don't have any time. You can, I know you, you run with it. It might take us three years to get that conversation on the schedule. <laughs> um, <laughs> Ali, what? Uh, well, me. I want to ask a. Uh, maybe a, I don't know, uh, a, a obvious question. Who's Jane? Like, where, where'd that come from? Like, oh, Jane. Yeah, Jane was, it was just sort of a branding exercise originally. So, yeah. Jane obviously operated without a name for a long time. And then we, when we started looking at publicized, like publicly making Jane available, we were looking at a lot of the other clinic softwares out there. And here in kind of our local ones were a lot of like, clinic master clinic server practice perfect practice fusion like all the, even the ones you know they're all kind of just multiple clinic words mm -hmm. together. 
And we would be talking to people and they wouldn't even know what they were using. They'd be like, oh, it's practice something. Like, I'm not totally sure. So like, they just couldn't even, the, the name was so forgettable. Yeah. So we knew we wanted to be different than that. And we also knew we wanted Jane to have a name that was, that represented like helpful and friendly and simple and personified. And we knew we wanted it to just feel like it was part of your practice. Yeah. And then Trevor really wanted um, the name to become like part of the vernacular of the clinic. So he wanted people to say like, not look in the schedule, but go look in Jane or mm -hmm. can you put it in Jane or Jane has that. And so it, and it really worked. Like people talk about Jane all the time as Jane, they don't. And so our customers will even, they'll do a lot of her and she. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of have a different relationship with Jane. And then we chose the name Jane specifically just because it was a, like just a simple, it kind of seemed like a accessible, easy to say, easy to remember. And then some of our branding was around like see Jane, you know, see Jane run. Uh -huh. And so some of our branding was like see Jane chart, see Jane books, see Jane schedule, see Jane run your clinic. So it just- That's awesome. Was there like, was like Rose and Jennifer also in the running no. or does this like come to you all of a sudden one day after working out or something? On there. You know what, one of the other names was Doctopus which was going to be like an octopus that had little things in all its arms. Yeah. You know, there's a screen, there's a picture somewhere of all the, of all the names on a board. I should find it. But yeah, we didn't have a lot of other women, like just names. And it, we didn't really even care if it was a woman or a man. It just, mm -hmm. and actually recently people are saying like, I wish it wasn't called a woman's name. That's so sexist. <laughs> like, cause they think, I think that we're thinking it's like receptionist name in a way that's sexist or something uh -huh. and I was like oh fascinating yeah. never even occurred to me that this might be considered like a sexist and possibly because I am a woman and most of our team is actually probably I think we have more women than men working at Jane so it never really occurred and I'm obviously all for you know female yeah. empowerment in general if that's a thing or just equality but that's anyway <laughs> I was surprised. It didn't even occur to me that that might be considered something. But I just, I wonder what story they think is behind that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. idea. And if it had been a different name, would it still feel the same? I'm sure right. it would have. Right. That's but we don't have any kids named Jane. Like we have multiple babies coming this year in the Jane team world. And I'm just waiting for someone to call their baby Jane or yeah. get a Jane tattoo. That also hasn't happened yet. I was just going to ask any Jane tattoos yet. No. Although I'm going to shave Jane into my head. Uh-huh. Or our user conference. Yeah. If I get a Jane tattoo, does do I get something special like yeah, a absolutely. ribbon or something? I promise. I love a hoodie. Uh, you, you get a hoodie. Any okay. of your viewers, you get a Jane tattoo. I will send you. I will send you a hoodie and a free awesome. description for life. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, Ali, uh, that's so great. So thank you. I, I, we're about out of time. I just while we're on the topic, uh, where do people find? out about you where do they get more info about jane or, or find you online if, if they're looking for more information um the website which is jane.app jane.app that is the entire thing sometimes people get confused it's and jane is a web app so you're not going to find jane on the um on the app store jane.com was sold like two weeks before we asked the person about it to mm -hmm. a i want to say a clothing company or something if you go to jane.com it is not us Although we often get reviews for jangot.com or people calling us about clothing that they've purchased or chicken strips. We also get phone calls about chicken strips from Jane for some reason that shows up as us. Um, so jane.app and yeah, there's all that info there. If you, and I, I think we were talking earlier about how we don't do free trials, but if yeah. people do want to learn if Jane's the good fit for them, we have a demo site that people can access and just play around that has all this fake data in it. So we can mm -hmm. give people to that anytime and then our support team we're actually awesome. going to change their name to product specialist because mm -hmm. they are they do everything they're they're in they're like sales because they do the demo and they do the support and they do the so the person you talk to is the same people it's the same group um through your entire time with jane whether you're a customer or not yet it's the same group and they're amazing super awesome. super smart people. Oh, that's great. And you also gave me a code for our listeners. Um, I think for a new practice helper or for people yeah. coming over, uh, that would be 
uh, $25 off your license um, for the first six months. Is that right? Yeah, this is like for brand new practices, just yep. starting having started a practice from scratch myself. I, I think that we sometimes feel a little bit too like empathetic towards mm -hmm. our customer base, but that's fine because we do price Jane very fairly. We always say it's like the price of one visit per practicing practitioner. So you only get charged for people who are actually working, um, treating patients like scheduled. So yeah. admin staff are no cost, billers are no cost. Anyone that you want to give access to, that's no mm -hmm. cost. Awesome. Um, so it's, let me give yeah, out the code. Yeah, I think it was pod new P O D N E W. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. that's right. Just made that up this morning. It's good code, right? I'm good. Yeah, it's a great code. Pod new. Yeah. Pod new. Right. And we'll we'll put all those we'll put all those links and stuff on the show notes. So if you're in iTunes or on the um go to our website, you can get all that the links and the discount code. Um Allie, uh before we go. Is there something that you've learned growing either you're working in a physio clinics, building one yourself or building a software company or just being an entrepreneur person in the physio realm that you think um, people should know about that we haven't maybe touched on yet? Oh, I think we covered most of the things that I think mm -hmm. had a really pertinent crossover between the two. Mm -hmm. um, other than recognizing that small business is the hardest size of business to run. I will say running a medium sized business is, much easier not even medium like we're still small on the on this the grand scheme of things but yeah. we call um we call it vsbs that's who most of our customers are vsbs solo to 10 practitioners mm -hmm. like very small businesses it is by far the most challenging and i feel um and i've definitely had that lesson brought home by by working in a large organization there's just so much more leeway there's just buffers that don't exist in a small company so i think my empathy having done it and then also understanding what it's like to be part of a, a bigger company mm -hmm. and you're it feels a bit lonely sometimes but um it's definitely it's true what you're feeling is true it's it can feel like hard work and that can be right. true but it's also so wonderful so yeah. Yeah, yeah i think that that's probably awesome well that's great no that's, that's absolutely important it is it's tough <laughs> it's hard it's supposed to be and it's supposed to be rewarding and some yeah, days so it feels like you can't get through it and just know that if you persevere, it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. When you say, I mean, <clears throat> you even told me you didn't even recognize when you were, you know, having the, you know, like failures because you view it so differently. And I think as people get into this, they, if you learn to, you can learn to do that. And that makes the thing that the whole journey a little bit easier when you said you wouldn't you agree. Yeah. And then I think it's just also ensuring that your failures aren't like you're losing your house, which mm -hmm like that's a different level of failure or you're, you know, so just identifying the risk level before you take the, the risk and if it's acceptable to you or not. Right. Right. That's awesome. Well, the reward for me, the, the total upside is so much bigger than the risks that I take right now. <laughs> you know, to me, my family and to people, like the people are calling say, I was told I need a multi-level fusion. I'm like, and you went to yoga this week. Yeah. Okay. So maybe your back isn't an emergency situation. Can right. help you? you know, if I can help two of those people a month or a year or in my lifetime, I call that an upside win. Really um, helping other know. people in any capacity. You know, it's, it's kind of the best part of life actually. Mm -hmm. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> I think it's cool that it makes you feel so good to help other people. Like, yeah. and then, I don't know. I just think there's, it's, it's under, it's, yeah. It's called fill in your bucket. There's a kid's book called fill, fill your bucket or fill right. other people's. Anyway, everyone should find it and read it. Even if you're an adult, it talks a lot about how to, if you're feeling like your bucket's empty, you fill another person's bucket and it fills your bucket too. It's magic. Oh, that's so, cool. Yeah. Well, then that's a great, that's a great uh, idea. What's the name of the book? Do you remember? It's something about filling your bucket. Yeah. It's really, it's a very sweet little, it's a sweet book. Oh, that's great. Well, Allie, thank you so much for being here. It was awesome. Yeah, it was my pleasure. I just ramble on about many things. So you're gonna have to splice that together into something interesting. Yeah, we'll cut out some really <laughs> interesting stuff and make you look yeah. really awesome. Okay, great. you are awesome. And conversation having the conversation with you today and having sharing what you're doing on the podcast has just been an honor and a pleasure. And uh, I'm looking forward to it next time. So thank you. And for the cash PG lunch hour for Allison Taylor and Aaron LeBauer. You know, just look at your failures like an opportunity to learn and keep going for it because people out there need your help. Go fill their bucket. Thank you very much.